Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very, very excited for this episode. We are still on site in Boston, Massachusetts. We are at the new research building in Dr. George Church's office. We are gonna be talking about all things synthetic biology and his lab and what's going on for us in this new evolution of our future. George, thank you so much for joining oh, us on the you. show. My pleasure. Greatly yeah. appreciate yeah. it. Um, this is our second episode with George. The first one was super short uh, at Arc Fusion, and I'm really glad that I've had more time to study up for this one, and we're gonna go into a little bit more depth on a lot of the really important fields that you're working in. For those that don't know, uh, George Church is a geneticist, a molecular engineer, a chemist, he is a professor at Harvard and MIT, last 33 years. This is, it's an incredible amount of students and teaching that's been going on. He runs the Church Lab, which has 100 people. It's grown over 33 years to have 100 people working within the Church Lab on a bunch of different uh, disciplines of uh, advancing us into the future. So he's co-founded 22 companies co-authored 500 papers, 143 patent pu publications, author of Regenesis, and so much more. George, you have an insanely incredible bio. You have been at the edge of knowledge for so long, pushing the boundaries. So this is an honor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. So, all right, <clears throat> let's, let's start with this big history understanding of where we've found ourselves kind of as stewards of Earth and figuring out now tweaking the biology. So this is a major transitionary moment. How have you seen that evolution of civilization up until this point of synthetic biology? Well, that's a obviously big question. Uh, but uh, I think one of the things that, that critics often point out is we make mistakes. And there's no doubt about it. We are a species of engineers. That is, that is both our uh, that's our past and our future is almost certainly has to do with uh, our uh, unique ability to really think deeply about the past and the future and to engineer as a consequence. We, we, we do make mistakes, but we're probably the only species that is capable of protecting any or all of the species from catastrophic events like uh, asteroids, the sun expansion, et cetera. So uh, we have that responsibility to ourselves and, and many other species. Uh, and maybe to the whole universe. We, there, there is still yet an open question as to whether we're the only intelligence uh, in, the, in the entire universe. It's, I mean, it's, it's arrogant to think of it either way, that, that, we're the, that we're the only one or that we're one of a billion. You know, it's, it's just, it's arrogant to think we know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. lots of civilizational hubris. And yeah. you, you, you point out that we have a lot of sort of um, ways of figuring out how to best use these powers and you point out to um, to, to species and I, and I actually wanted to make this point as you are investigating how to do things like bring the woolly mammoth back into at least a, a point of awe within our own awareness there's so many species that we could bring back as a point of awe and as an awareness expansion for ourselves to be able to see how we got to this point is that kind of where that drive for the species comes from well so uh i think the woolly mammoth is the best example of something where we can get more than just awe i mean awe is amazing already but uh, we can we can get things that are potentially beneficial to the species there and and to species preservation in general the species being Asian elephant um, by bringing in other bits of DNA that could help it survive in the modern world um, but also to help uh, the Arctic environment uh, where where they can uh, participate in carbon sequestration which could benefit the entire planet um, uh, preventing uh, carbon loss and, and sequestering new carbon. So when we think about species, you know, de-extinction, we're typically talking about de-extinction of genes. Most all mm -hmm. uh, animal, plants and animals and bacteria are hybrids of related uh, organisms, and we're creating a particular hybrid which will be cold-resistant Asian elephants. It'll extend their range, it'll help, help them help us uh, with carbon sequestration. 
so see, there's there's many ways to engineer to uh, advance our world. Like you said, carbon sequestration is one of them. There are oh, there's so many of these different ways to to help advance us. Now, I want to ask, you know, as we kind of dive into the the deeper subject areas prior to getting there, w you know, what what you did with in 1975 with uh, X-ray crystallography of transfer RNA and mm -hmm. seeing how that um, how that affects the uh, carrying of instructions to other parts of the cell. That was kind of a big moment for you. Mm -hmm. And that was at the cutting edge of knowledge. And you've spent the next 40 years at the cutting edge, plus years at the cutting edge of knowledge, right. always pushing, always yeah. pushing the edge of what we know. Tell us about that. Uh, it, it's not just knowledge, it's also engineering, uh, but yeah, the, the transfer RNA, I was a teenager when I was first introduced to this research project, uh, my son Ho Kim and his team, and uh, I um, was doing, I started out as just a job, but I, I, it was one that I picked, uh, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, to, to be uh, the fusion of math, physics, chemistry, biology, um, computer science, all in one package, because you really had to have all of those to, 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 it's not like looking through a microscope where you just see things, you actually have to solve the structure. It, but it also introduced me to the whole world of nucleic acids, and I, you know, the epiphany of typing in all of the sequences that were known at the time, the one-dimensional structures, folding over the three dimensions, and then seeing how, in a sense, how easy that was, uh, and, and how valuable it would be to have the one-dimensional structure of everything in the world. Um, it also introduced me to, uh, to automation. So we had all that data was automatically collected. This is in 1974, uh, and almost nothing was computerized or automated in the rest of the uh, rest of biology. And I thought, well, time to, to introduce that. Um, and there were many other aspects of it. You know, first folded RNA first folded into click acid, uh, it was, uh, led me to a lot of, almost everything we're, st we're still working on has to do with that. And we still work on even transfer RNA itself and the genetic code, changing genetic codes of yeah. a number of organisms now. And George was um, a, a pioneer in uh, genome sequencing and still is uh, in genome sequencing. And, and you've seen that drop in, in price and speed so we are now doing things much faster and much more cost effectively. I mean, you've co-founded uh, several companies in the space, uh, Veritas Genetics, Nebula Genomics. So teach us about what's happening because you're, you're specifically making a big push to the idea of um, open access mechanisms because there's a lot of silos of data and we want to be able to leverage open access to data in safe ways that make it easier for medical research. Yeah, well, exactly. So there were, there were two components from the very beginning for me. One was the technical part of bringing down the cost and we've you know, pursued m most recently fluorescent next-gen sequencing and nanopores to help do that. We brought it down 10 million fold in cost. But in addition to that technical part, it, there's a social component which is convincing people it's safe and that it's effective, you know, that it, that it does something that they care about. Um, and the problem is it's kind of a seatbelt situation where even after the seatbelts were installed in your car as effectively free, and even though there were laws and so forth, to really get people to pay attention, you had to have a circuit that sensed that your seatbelt was, was sealed and then it would shut off the annoying sound. And I think we have a similar thing here where about 1% of the people are at risk for genetic diseases and they sort of feel like, well, I'm exempt because there's nobody in my family yet. But the thing is, that's almost always the scenario is there's nobody in your family until there is one. Um, so, uh, so what Veritas and, and Nebula do is Veritas brought the price down to $1,000 and started getting it out to r closer to regular people. But Nebula brings it down to zero dollars and starts um, making the connection to researchers like pharmaceutical companies much more friction-free, mm -hmm. um, simultaneously making convincing arguments that, that they're to, to lower, what, there are two things that worry people. One is the safe, you know, is their is there data secure? And Nebula can, using combination of blockchain encryption, we can guarantee that 
the data is only used the way you originally wanted it to be used. You can, you can secure it so that your physician can't see it, insurance companies can't see it, can't be subpoenaed because you, actually, you never actually had it, nobody else has it. It can only be used for a list of things that you approved in advance mm -hmm. that could benefit you and nothing could be yeah. held against you and you don't need, you, you can even protect it from yourself so you don't learn anything that you don't want to learn. So uh, that's, a, that's a breakthrough and then the, the breakthrough of getting the, the drug companies to pay for your genome and even maybe pay, possibly paying you for the education and time um, completely blows away the thousand dollars, you know, with um, making something where you could potentially profit from your genome without ever yeah. actually selling it to anyone. The, the importance, as you said, of, of privacy for an individual's full genome sequence and then to have these access controls where mm -hmm. we ourselves can decide where we want the data to flow mm -hmm. and who we want to, to help. Plus then, not only have that be a free of cost for us to understand our whole genome, but then for medical research to be able to be done f on how the, we can best help with diseases and all different types of understandings of, of, of different humans. Mm -hmm. this, this, is, this is a crucial advancement and it's a new way of thinking about things, of offering, offering data, which is this most precious and also d one of the best ways to better understand ourselves, oh, giving that in a safe way to researchers and then letting them re un better understand humans and also potentially get paid. And this could potentially be a good way to get into something like a universal basic income, mm -hmm. is giving our data and then being able to get paid for that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's exciting stuff and that is, I love your push for that. Though these open access mechanisms, it's it's very right. very cool that you're the silos push. are very problematic at both ends. They're neither that they're, uh, they're they don't benefit the patient much. They it's very hard to uh, to get in. Uh, when you get in, what you can do with it is very limited. Um, and so at the at the very open end of the spectrum is the personal genome project, and then at the at the level where almost anything could be uh, communicated without anyone ever having your individual genome in their possession in, a, in an encrypted form. The normal way that you, s you encrypt, use encryption is I'll send you an encrypted email, you'll uncrypt, you decrypt it at the other end, but at that moment it, it's, it's out of my hands and it's in its full embodiment at your end. But with things like homomorphic encryption, you can ask questions of a group of us and get your uh, data back without ever, without you or anyone outside of my control ever having my open genome. So uh, you can ask the same questions you would ask, but they're all the questions and answers are all in, uh, um, via this encryption. This this leads us into another pressing area that that you're working on. We've seen over the last six or so years this this evolution of of CRISPR into our lives of of better leveraging evolutionary technologies for over billions of years, like bacteria. So with the Cas9's ability to go in and do things like genetic editing and engineering, that is birthing this new, there's a second wave that's coming now of genetic engineers leveraging uh, CRISPR's Cas9, but also other like SC Cas9. So there's new sorts of ways to, uh, to I want you to, t to tell us about this second wave because you guys have a good amount of second waivers mm -hmm. in your lab and you're pushing the, the edge again in genetic engineering. Yeah. I would say it's probably, you know, eighth wave or something like that because there, yeah. there were many genome editing methods before CRISPR and there'll be probably many after. Good um, point. And uh, CRISPR is not even that good at doing precise editing where you, where you want to say change uh, a G to a T. That's very hard to do with, with CRISPR. Um, it's, These are single good point at, mutations that you're right. About. It, it can make single point mutations, but sort of randomly, and and sometimes it hits adjacent bases that you didn't want to touch, mm -hmm. and 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 that 
there, there were ways, there have been other ways to do that. So for example, there's a lambda red system that allows you to do that. There's a AAV, single-stranded DNA based method. There are a bunch of uh, in integrases switch where you can pop in a cassette precisely and then you got the point mutations in that cassette. So uh, these are only slightly less efficient than CRISPR right at the moment. Um, and they will inevitably get, the everything will get easier and cheaper. And at that point, you will pick the ones the best. And that's been the history with sequencing too, is that everything is, there were all kinds of compromises and shortcuts and so forth, and those have fallen away now that you'll just pick the best sequencing right now, which is whole genome sequencing. Yeah, so I listed some of the ones that are, that are, that are precede CRISPR, and those same ones are up and coming because they could blow past it because of their precision. It, it, was, it was so interesting how you were like, nah, Alan, this is the eighth wave. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, okay, and the, yeah, because this is, what was it, TAL, right, T-A-L? So, so TAL was the, the one just before CRISPR, and it's still in use. It's still in clinic, it's in clinical trials. Um, people use it for research. Um, you, just like you can send off an order to get CRISPR, in other words, nobody actually, almost nobody makes CRISPR in their own lab. What they'll do is they'll order the synthetic uh, modifications and mm. then it'll come back in and then they'll do the experiment in their lab. Uh, and the same thing with TAL, as you order it and it comes back mm. in. And the prices are not that different. Um, mm. And so in the end, it's going to be which one handles the sequence that you want. So, so for example, there are regions, of, many regions of the genome where none of the known CRISPRs will cut there. Okay, but the towels are uh, yeah. basically you can make one to cut anywhere. Yeah, and uh, that's so what that's we're an advantage so that, in yeah. terms of precision. Yeah, and this is what we're looking at, aiming to be able to do a hundred percent of the genome rather than just exactly. the limited. I think it's close to what seventy yeah. percent or so right now. And it's the and the hard. other advantage, uh, or the other thing we're looking for for the next next generation is ability to do multiple sites at once. Ooh. So if right now if we're having problems doing one, in other words, we're having on target and off target problems. Yeah. If you do two sites, three sites, we, we can now do 15,000 sites, then you need to have something that's very low toxicity and very precise. And so that's another, that's another standard measurement for how well we're improving is, is how high a multiplex level we can get to. Whoa, multi-targeting. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, just quickly, um, off-targeting is when you're looking at a, a, a sequence of, of DNA that looks similar to where you, right. and it accidentally goes there. And then um, on-target, what what, how can you have an on-target error? On-target meaning you're trying to change, uh, uh, you're trying to make a precise edit, like a G to a T, oh. and, you, and you make a little bit bigger uh, oh, so, so you could call that off target, off by one, but by it's basically <laughs> it's on target. It's the right gene, and uh, okay. uh, it's just not it's just not very precise on target. So off target is a completely different part yeah. of the genome, not even in the in a related gene. And in our very first yes. paper where we turned CRISPR into technology, we anticipated that we wrote computer programs that would help you avoid off target because I th I, th I think it's easy to just naively say, oh, I'm gonna use the computer to design it to hit this gene and you ignore it, but you need to think holistically, you need to think about the whole genome. So that's what we did yes. in our very first paper. Now, George, give us your understanding of, there's, this was part of bacterial evolution. We're now starting to see billions of years of, the, of what they've understood as best uh, ways to boost up their own immune systems. We're trying to understand what they're doing and apply that to ourselves. And we're trying to use computational biology to really best understand a lot of this. So can you tell us what your thoughts are about leveraging computational biology to better you do genetic engineering? Right, so there's, we use bi computational biology in almost every aspect of everything, every research we do. This is just one of them. So it, it can be used for computer-aided design. Mm -hmm. um, certainly you need to, to, to edit the genome. You need to be able to read it up front you need to know what it is you're editing, and at the end you need to read it again to make sure what you edited was what you wanted, yep. right? Yep. So uh, there's a lot of computational uh, components there. You need to go through, uh, you need to get inspiration from somewhere. So you need to look through human populations for people that are exceptionally resistant to diseases. Uh, 
You need to look for people that, that you know, the contribution to common diseases. Uh, look at animals um, for, um, and, and bacteria for, for additional yeah. tools that you can use. Um, so all of that's computational. Interesting, yeah. Yep. So yeah, exactly, computational biology being leveraged into all different aspects of the lab, and also um, the, the sort of without getting too much into the um, ethics and the and the geopolitics of things, um, you, are you is your most is your we've now through through evolution we've been we've been doing our own uh, genetic engineering through through breeding over time, and it's taken much longer. Now we can go immediately and start tweaking. We can eradicate disease. We can do augmentations to humans. Um, which are, do you have a specific kind of favorite that you're most interested in, in the space? Well, so the, the most powerful preventative medicine, uh, which is also augmentation that, uh, that we should all be familiar with, which we should be constantly celebrating, is vaccines. We have about a couple dozen vaccines that make us superhuman relative to our ancestors. They, they lived in fear of you know, a smallpox, of polio, yeah. of uh, many diseases that we now have, uh, we're not fearful of um, because they're either completely extinct, uh, nearly extinct, or uh, um, completely controlled um, by the vaccination process. Um, that, in principle, some of that um, could be, uh, there could be similar things that happen that increase our health over our lifetime. There could be gene therapies, for example, that could reverse aging as we get older. Um, there could be some that uh, have cognitive advantages as we get older so that we prevent the cognitive decline mm -hmm. in a population that's uh, rapidly becoming kind of lopsided on the, on the older end of, this, of the demographic spectrum. Um, we could have, you know, uh, cognitive enhancement to reduce that cognitive decline, yeah. and uh, and who knows where we go from there. But those are examples of things where genetics is not fundamentally different from drugs, except the connections between mechanism and therapy is so much more direct and faster. And so we um, we need to uh, they'll go through the normal uh, uh, vetting processes of safety and efficacy through the FDA, the EMA, CFDA, and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you started touching on, on uh, neuroplasticity and neurodegeneration, and so yeah. I wanna, you have the brain initiative going on, you have the um, connectome going on, and so this is mapping all of the neural pathways and neural networks within our entire nervous system. Right. This is very exciting. Uh, teach us about why this is so important. So the brain is, is very special in many ways. It's one of the things that separates us from other animals, our ability to, to think about the past and the future. To, you know, uh, it's not just memory, it's our ability to, to uh, think out of the box, to uh, intuit, to emote, um, to show sympathy, and uh, all of that's, uh, we can, another thing that makes it unique is you can replace almost any part of your body. I mean, as we go into the future, organ transplants will become Mm -hmm. uh, very easy, um, but it's hard to play certain parts of your brain that are responsible for the memories that make you, you. Um, so we want to learn more about how that's encoded, um, and we want to do it uh, inexpensively, something that could be used clinically, where we know the connection of every, you know, every neuron might be connected to a thousand other neurons, you know, 36 billion neurons, each with a thousand connections or big range. and and whether those connections are inhibitory or excitatory, mm. um, we can map out this at mole single molecule level. So we can really go down to a resolution of, of the synapse. Um, and, we, and we have uh, uh, a, a big uh, government project uh, um, from IARPA called the Microns Project that it aims for synapse re revolution, resolution connectome. Plus we can find out what the lineage of the cells were, you know, what cells begat you know, what precursors became, became those cells, where they migrated, and what, and what their expression state is, which again is relevant to mm -hmm. understanding. If, and if you had to, um, 
that kind of deep understanding, you could reconstruct it if it got broken, yeah. potentially. Um, I mean, we're going to start with very simple things like dopamine and Parkinson's, yeah. but eventually we'll get to more, be able to reconstruct more and more complicated connectomes. So we have to, uh, you have to read and write the, um, the brain cells. And not just neurons, but glia, um, yeah. you know, uh, ligand endocytes and so on. Yeah. Wow, all the way down to the, <clears throat> to the, to the small, even to the synaptic level. Right, yeah. Wow. Yes. It's a so we have super map. resolution with multiple high quality antibodies that can tell us pre and post synaptic excitatory inhibitory yeah. at the synapse level kind of thing. Whoa. Yeah. And this is getting a lot deeper than just knowing prefrontal cortex, amygdala. Right. This is way, oh, yeah. right. way cool and deep. Yeah. Um, and then now this is, this is actually ties us into the importance of preservation. We've gotten this far as a civilization in many regards due to collective learning that we've been able to build on top every single millennia up yeah. until this point. And so now as we go with minds like you, we want to retain as much as we can of, of what's built up in your mind over time and then be able to right. tap into that in the yeah. future and access it and understand yeah. how you got to where you got. Yeah. Yeah. and whatnot yeah. and how how specifically um are 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 you working on um your own uh neuroplasticity as well as offsetting uh, moving yourself away from neurodegeneration yeah i don't i don't think of it so much as about me i mean i was taught yeah. as a youth to serve everybody else first. That's uh, right. But we need you too, George, we need you. I, I think there is a, a bit of a tragedy that occurs among many uh, highly skilled people is that it really takes a lifetime, a current lifetime, to get to a, a, a point of competence. You know, I, I think that I didn't feel particularly competent until I hit my 64th birthday and now I actually feel like I can do my job because I've been properly educated. Um, it would be a pity to like build this and program the supercomputer and then unplug it the, sec the day that it's, that it's finally working. Uh, and that's, um, you know, I, I've, I've already yeah. uh, twice the age, uh, average age of my ancestors, uh, you know, that yeah. our longevity has doubled yeah. roughly. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's more and more occurring at the later years of life. So if we could extend the youth Yes. Uh, ness of the body, this regenerative properties that yeah. you see, most diseases that kill us in industrialized nations um, do not kill 20 year olds. Um, and so that sort of planned obsolescence, if we can reverse it, um, then we can have all the advantages of this um, education, this 60 years of education. Yeah. Uh, Plus the flexibility of mind that you get and the and the uh, vigor of a, a youthful body, um, and I think that's um, at least an option that we want to uh, strongly uh, explore. It's so beautifully said that there's so much hubris in. 20 year olds and, <laughs> and then we, the proper education only you know yeah. once you're 60 yeah. you're like I, I know a little bit about the world now right. yeah. yeah and then right. now it's and now it's just so important like you indicated stay healthy longer keep that that youthful homeostatic capacity up until your later years therefore we can be more creative we can contribute more in our later years with that mm -hmm. mountain of knowledge that we have right. later on right. very well said now Ooh, yeah, let's, and, and you're on the um, advisory board with SENS. Strategy That's right, and, uh, SENS, and I, yeah. I, I've uh, also a recent startup called Rejuvenate Bio, which is aimed at using gene therapy to do aging reversal in dogs and then, and then move into human clinical trials uh, with, this, with the same um, genes. Uh, so h hitting this from multiple angles uh, for longevity, now Okay, this is this 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 is um, kind of like how we perceive the world and the mechanisms of which things work. Not only this camera system, 
uh, our, everything from our phones to uh, all different types of biomaterials that we see, buildings even, our ecology, architecture and, and uh, ecology. There's so many interesting ways to have bio-inspired um, materials and robotics and all different types of things. This is what's going on with you at the um, WIS Institute. I said, and I'm pronouncing that Vies. right? Vies. Vies. Yeah. Vies Institute. Right. There we go. Vies Institute, which um, you're a co-founding member of. Now, Teach us about what you're excited about with the biomaterials. Right, so um, biology ha is just another enge engineering discipline, but it also has some uh, interesting advantages. One advantage is we have extremely complex, beautifully uh, debugged systems because they've been de debugged over billions of years over, you know, uh, uh, many orders of magnitude of, of land and, and air and, and liquid, um, we inherit that. So that's one thing advantage. The other advantage is we can redo some of that. We can do evolution in the lab, but we can do evolution kind of on steroids uh, where, we, where we can accelerate evolution. So we have that. Plus we have all the advantages from all the engineer, other engineering disciplines like computer-aided design. So all these things combine to make something that's highly accelerated. But we have a fourth thing, which is extremely uh, important and maybe not obvious, is that we is that we want to atomic we want we, we, we would like to be able to do atomically precise engineering, if it's free, and and basically biology basically does that. It it uh, almost everything it does is capable of being atomically precise. Almost every molecule it's made is the same as every other molecule of that type. Um, and that, and it does it at scale, so you can make things the size of a giant redwood or the size of an entire ecosystem, wow. um, and basically for free. That forest didn't really cost us anything to, uh, to build. So atomically precise, at scale, billions of years of evolution, and ability to evolve on our own. So instead of making a prototype in any other field of engineering, like a, a prototype for a bridge or a cell phone, where you really put a lot of energy into one prototype, mm. here you can make a trillion prototypes and let evolutionary processes pick the best one. You just have to be clever about setting up the accelerated evolution. So this Interesting. is the amazing uh, capability of, of uh, biology including materials. And it's not just biologically inspired materials where you can make atomically precise versions of things that are normally imprecise. Um, you know, like instead of making mortar, um, we can make a shell, you know, with all its intricate patterns on it. So mortar is just kind of like blob of stuff that you smooth out. Um, but we can also make biology make things that you normally don't think are biological, right? Not, not shells. But, th but like shells made out of inorganic materials. So we should be able, literally everything we can make, metals, semiconductors, all of that, we know how to make those with biology. We know how biology can make metals, it can make, it can make um, refractive index gradient optical fibers, it can, it, it, it can make thinking machines. Uh, some of the best supercomputers in the world are, are biologically manufactured. So I, I think that nothing that is currently manufactured without biology is safe <laughs> from, from uh, disruption and revolution. And this is a, this is a really good point for, for young people as well watching is that there are so many ways for them to, to dive into bio-inspired materials. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. No matter what field you've come from, there is a biological version of that, it, especially if you're an engineer or scientist. But I would say almost everything that's societally influenced is also biologically influenced because society is yeah. a bunch of biological atoms when you come right down to it. Okay, George, this is, this is crazy. You have over 33 years, you've built up a lab, the church lab, and your lab has 100 people now that how is this how do you possibly figure out how to manage this this is this is important because we have now we're moving into these 
labs. At Boyden has a really popular now lab. We have more of these labs sort of popping up with these really roaring groups of, of scientists and engineers, intellectuals, pushing the boundaries of knowledge. And we want to know how to best design the, the, the frameworks and the flows of information in these labs. So, you know, maybe we start off by asking you, you know, here you are um, running this lab. How do you pick what to research and how do you delegate um, research to other people? Yeah, well a lot of this has to do with co-mentoring. So uh, I co-mentor with Ed Boyden and Bob Langer and Sangeeta Vetia. We, we help each other out because uh, we're running kind of similar kinds of labs. Um, and there's co-mentoring within the lab. Uh, uh, you don't necessarily need a big hierarchy um, if you've got uh, kind of goodwill. Um, I select for people that are nice. I mean, that's one of my yeah. first interview questions is, 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 or discussions is, is how you achieve that kind of environment. Um, you you want to have a, a, an environment where failure is an option, but fail fast to get on to the next thing, do a bunch of things in parallel. Um, it's like the lesson of biology is not to make one prototype, but a trillion prototypes. Well, it's hard to do a trillion projects, but you can at least do more than one. Um, you know, have a, a kind of a, a, a real group size of about three. So, so the hundred is just a group, bunch of groups of three. That, okay. Um, have interdisciplinary teams. So it's hard to make an interdisciplinary team out of disciplinarians. So it's easier to make it out of people that are themselves interdisciplinary. So if yes. you have like two people that know two different languages, even if there's no overlap mm -hmm. of any of those languages, they, uh, they know how to gain a third one. So they each gain a third one that's a shared language and then they can, okay. and they can build up this network of people that are just, then you can decorate it with a few disciplinarians at the end. But the major network of, of uh, know-how, I think has to be people who feel comfortable with two or more fields in their own head. Interesting. Um, and this is like molecular biology and computer science, maybe something like that. Uh, or, or, you know, uh, philosophy or ethics and ethics. and uh, and medicine or medicine, yeah. uh, you know optics and genetics Ooh. for to, so yeah. you can know the three dimensional structure of the of the genome and yeah. etc. There, there's, there's uh, and once you get used to it, then it become it becomes it, you know you're good at whatever you do. And if you have a lab that does interdisciplinary stuff and does entrepreneurship and does um, and mm -hmm. really generally has its sights on transformative technology. Yeah. Um, then something that seems like science fiction becomes more routine uh, yeah. because that's what you do every day is you transform things that look hard into things that are actually easy. You don't want to be actual heroes. You just want to find the low-hanging fruit and, and help everybody get to it. There was a couple of really important points there. This co-mentorship, and we've seen over and over again that mentorship is such a acceleration of one's fullest potential into the world. So that was a big one. And then also this this uh, interdisciplinary approach across. Um, we've, we talk about this so much of having different fields that we're really, uh, really knowledgeable in that we can mesh together and work with other teams. It's these groups of three, like you said, within mm -hmm. the hundred. Um, and then I really appreciated how you talked about entrepreneurship. You're actually trying to translationally take what you're building at the edge and put that out into the world and make that available to people. Mm -hmm. It's so crucial. So. How do you keep up? How does the lab keep up and all these labs around the world now? There's the, the doubling of scientific papers is just so fast now. There's not enough eyeballs to scan them and understand them. Yeah. How do you keep up? Uh, well, in a way, our task is worse speak, or harder because we're trying to be interdisciplinary. We're, we, we don't know where the next um, idiosyncratic oddity from physics or or uh, our ethics or, could, or chemistry could impact our lab. Um, so we have to constantly, ha we have a, have a lot of antennae out there. So part of the reason for having a largish um, interdisciplinary group is that each individual is an antenna for their mm. specialties, mm. plural for each person. Um, and they may not be the best in the world at any particular task, some of them are. But they're good enough that they can talk to the, the uh, world's experts. Uh, so that's one way. We don't need everything because we're, we're mainly doing this for engineering. So we, we need things that are um, capable of 
turning into something that, that the rest of the world could benefit from. Yeah. So uh, that, that, that's a luxury. And just in, in general, when you have a lot of things working, you know, a lot of balls in the air that nobody else has, you're not, we're not catching up with other groups, we're kind of staying ahead. And in a way, that's kind of easier yeah. in a certain way. It, it means we'll probably make a few more mistakes than the average group, but, uh, but we'll have a lot more warning um, when new things are coming on down the pipe because a lot of those new things came from our lab yeah. or from the alumni of our lab. I like the way that you explained this, it as in tennis, is that yeah. you, they, that you, we, we gotta have the, we gotta constantly be receiving the, the edges across the different disciplines and plugging it into what yeah. we know. George, how, um, with these uh, 500 co-authored publications and um, 143 patent publications, how are you uh, ensuring that what you've done people actually understand and also that the information in your lab is really properly being transgenerationally disseminated. Right. Uh, well, within the lab, it's pretty easy. There's a lot of side-by-side uh, -side commentary that you can't, really can't get by books or lectures or that sort of thing. Mm. You need to be sitting next to them uh, day in, day out. So, so that's why these teams of three uh, really uh, you know, are, are the best way of getting really complicated things communicated and, and take it to the next step. Uh, but there is still a need for educating the general public and, 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 and reverse, so it's a conversation, it's two way, uh, it's a broad societal conversation, because some of these topics um, you know, have difficult policy components, yeah. they have uh, economic components, um, both people benefiting from what we do and also us benefiting from, from, from their funding. So, so we use various mechanisms. One is uh, there's an organization my wife started uh, called pged.org. Uh, uh, Ting Wu uh, started it in around 2006. And that uh, has congressional briefings uh, every six months or so for many years now. Um, they work with uh, with Hollywood for t on TVs and movies, which reached millions of people. Yes. Uh, both of those mechanisms reached um, millions of people. Um, uh, online uh, materials that, that educators, high school educators can just download. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, working with authors and journalists in various ways. So that, that reaches more people than you can reach in a simple classroom. Um, it's even more than you can reach with uh, these web classrooms are very popular, MOOCs and, and yeah, MOOCs things like that. And, and Harvard has a great one called edX. edX yeah. uh, but those don't reach nearly as many people as you can reach with Hollywood and Congress and, yes, yes. And, uh, and things like that. As we move forward with figuring out how to most effectively design the labs that we can have these hundreds of scientists, ethicists, engineers collaborating and, uh, and working on the edge of what's known by society. How would you optimally design the workflows there? You were giving this idea of mentorship. You, there's got to be a lab component. There's got to yeah. be, yeah, entrepreneur component. Yeah, so I think it was, it was hard to get going and it's not clear that it would transfer trivially is something where you, you need to have kind of a track record that attracts the best people because if you try to build, you know, a soup out of stone soup and nothing but stones is this problem. So, so part of it was a process where first we inherited the reputation of Harvard and MIT to attract the best students and postdocs. Um, but they still didn't believe in what the lab was doing. I mean, they would join, they believed it enough to join the lab, but that was, and it took another you know, many years to get yeah. it to the point where, but now we have a track record where it both attracts people and they believe. And the, yeah. and the more they believe, the more they accomplish, and it's a positive feedback loop, the more they accomplish, the more the next generation believe. And they train each other, um, and then, and they also create these entrepreneurship that will spin off a company, and then, the, then the, comp, the people from the company will come back and tell everybody what it's like on the other side. And, and they'll, it's like uh, older siblings that are like very protective of the younger ones coming up through the ranks. Um, and it's just wonderful to watch it happen because it didn't quite self-assemble. There was some nudging here and there, but it, it, for the most part, it's something that's self-sustaining now. Yeah. And it's, uh, 
and it's slightly amplifying each generation. So you have yeah. more and more alumni out there that kind of they have this little conspiracy that they, they help each other out uh, worldwide, and it's, it's really wonderful, yeah. Uh, that's a principle of patience and uh, of right. providing value, mm -hmm. and yep, and yep. it's been a long time, 33 years, so yeah. for all the young people that are really trying to get to where you're going right away, be patient, provide yeah. value, take your time getting there. Yeah. Okay, a couple quick things on the way out. Uh, George, what would you say is a core driving principle of your life? Oh, well, so it's changed over time. I think I had a, a kind of wacky idea what science was like when I was young. Um, but I would say that uh, fairly consistently I've tried to do two things, three things at once. Okay, so any one of these would be pretty cool. But is, as, as ask basic, you know, science, philosophy, philosophically interesting questions, you know, like that would be cool to know. Have something that's technological by fa many factors of 10, not just you know 1.5, and, and broad. So it's not just, I'm gonna, this is the way you fix a particular knee problem. Mm -hmm. This is something that, that every, everybody can use, like reading and writing DNA. Uh, and then the third thing is having it societally bene beneficial, not just yeah. you know, changing society, but in a, in a, in a way that uh, there's some consensus on, on, the, on the value of it. So if you can do all three things, you know, the basic science, the, the technological uh, disruption and the societal benefit, that, that's, uh, that's good. And, you know, it doesn't have to be medicine, it could be agriculture, it could yeah. be, um, you know, data storage, it can be yeah. getting off the planet, getting some of us off the planet to yeah. have a backup. All these things are, uh, you don't have to prioritize perfectly. Um, you, you certainly don't want to put all your chips on one thing that you think is the world's most important problem. You want to have a diverse portfolio for the world and f even for each individual. Yeah, oh, those are, that was so beautifully said. I yeah. love it. Um, <clears throat> this wouldn't be a simulation if we didn't ask you. Um, do you think this is a simulation? Um, you know, I, I think the simple answer is I don't know. Uh, I think that if it, it doesn't really matter to some extent because in the simulation, we need to be doing something, uh, you know, I, I doubt it personally, uh, but it, you know, it would, if it is it's such a sophisticated one that, that we might as well live out that. In that simulation, we may be the only intelligence in the planet, in the universe, and we better take it seriously. Uh, there's some reason why we're the only intelligence in that universe. Mm -hmm. you know. and George is like the video game character that uh, maxed out all of his attributes, especially in the field of biology. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, last question, George. Um, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing, you know, you know, no one's ever asked me that question in an interview. Uh, um, so I'll give a very spontaneous <laughs> answer. But I, w I, would, I would say the way that we uh, know about the world is the way we gain knowledge and, and uh, think about the past and the future is, very, is really quite beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, it's what makes us human. If we took away, if we changed ourselves in many ways that were unrecognizable visually, uh, sound different, if we can still do that, that's a beautiful thing. And that's, and that's the thing that will allow another be a beautiful thing it's related to is our ability to survive. That's the, that's the Darwinian beauty of the world. Um, but our ability to know is 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 one of the most potent ways of 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 we we can survive and all the things we we bring along with us. Thank you, George. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah. thank you so much for your continued work in yeah. this field at yeah. the edge and inspiring others. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you for coming yeah. out of the yeah. show and yeah. joining sure. us. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate you. Go ahead and give us your thoughts in the comments below on all things related to biology like we've been discussing with George. We'd love to hear from you. Also, go and build. Go and build. Manifest your dreams into the world, everyone. Go creatively execute. We love you so much. Thank you for tuning in. Also, check out all of the great links below to George's work and to the lab's work at Church Lab. And also join us as simulation so we can help scale this content to more people and come on site to great places and talk to some of the world's most brilliant leaders. We greatly appreciate you. Much love, and we'll see you soon. Peace.